So I'm going to hand out the syllabus. Some of you may have already looked at it online. Uh, some of you will ask me have a copy of it. At least a tentative schedule. Okay, so is everybody in the right place? Biology 101? Yeah? Did everybody get a copy of this with us? Yes, okay. So um, I just want to make sure that everybody in here today knows that this is a non majors science class. So if you were like, for example, pre med or pre vet, um, or are going to become a biologist, um, this is actually not the class that you need to be in. You need to be in the 200 level. So is anybody in here that is in that, in that situation? Okay. Yeah. So you guys are all poets, right? <laughs> okay, excellent. Sometimes they, people get a little uh, confused about that, that this 100 level is the um, non-majors and the 200 level is the majors. Okay, so my name is Michelle Miller, and um, I have been teaching at BMCC for over 20 years. And this is actually one of my favorite classes to teach because it is so interesting, and it's actually an area that continues to change. So, for example, when we get to the genetics part, obviously things are um, moving along quite rapidly in the area of being able to just simply go online and get your entire genome tested and find out whether or not you are predisposed to any particular diseases and that kind of stuff. So it's a really fun class, I think, and um, it is um, a uh, class in which we have the lecture portion and we also have the lab. So hopefully everybody knows which lab they are signed up for. There are two labs, Monday 2 to 4.30 and Wednesday 2 to 4.30. So we are going to have lab this week. Um, I would like you to come to um, lab with a notebook of some kind. And particularly, I think the best notebook for labs are a three ring binder with paper um, so that you can put the lab handouts directly into the lab notebook. The lab notebook is going to be something that you are going to turn into me, and that is how you're going to um, get graded for being present and participating in the lab portion of the class. So let's look at the syllabus. Um, right now, Monday lab is full. Um, if you are in Monday's lab, but you would rather be in Wednesday's, Wednesday's lab, you can go ahead and come to Wednesday. Um, as the quarter progresses, what will generally happen is that um, people will um, kind of maybe move a little bit between the two labs, and it is not a big deal if you do that. So, like, if you um, know that you're going to miss Monday's labs, just automatically come to Wednesday's. Or if you know that you're going to miss the Wednesday, hopefully you'll be able to come to the Monday before. There's really um, no way to make up a lab if you miss it. Um, so you want to make sure that you are, come to one of the labs. Okay. If you look at um, the syllabus, you'll also notice that we have a textbook which is online. And uh, the online textbook can be uh, gotten to most easily through Canvas. So if you go to your Canvas uh, site, um, one of the things, this is my Canvas site, so it's a little bit different than yours, but one of the things, does anybody, does everybody understand the whole Canvas thing that's going on here? This is what is referred to as the learning management system, and all of your classes 
should at least have the um, the grade book and the syllabus in the Canvas, and you can access it through Wolf Web. And if you go to uh, your course, which would be general biology, and you click on it, it's going to have some information here. So this is kind of I can't remember how I always turn the lights on. That's kind of weird. Can everybody see that? Okay. It's a little dim for some reason, I need to adjust that. So one of the things that you'll see is, is that there is a welcome, little information about Biology 101. And then this is the online textbook. And so you wanna make sure that when you go to the online textbook, that you don't have pop-ups blocked because what it's gonna to wanna to do is it's gonna to wanna to, um, take you to a, um, an outside website and it might pop up a window, okay? So this is the textbook, it's all available online. And um, however, if you're a person that really wants a printed out book, you can go to the bookstore and they have some available, and I believe that they can print more if there's, like, you know, people want it and they run out. And so it's only $15. So a few years ago, we decided that um, even though the fancy textbooks that are $250 are really, really nice, um, they have beautiful pictures, etc. Right, I love them, but we decided that it was just too much to ask of students to purchase a two hundred and fifty dollars textbook. Right, so these are uh, open educational resources that have been put together by various faculty. I did not write the book, but I put it together, so hence it has my name on the title. Um, so I didn't actually write any of the content. So you can um, use this online or go uh, buy a book. You can actually also download the whole thing as a PDF. I think you can print out parts of it, et cetera. Okay. Are there any questions about the textbook? Okay. It's not as pretty as the expensive textbook, but I think it, it does, it serves its purpose. Okay. The other thing that we will be doing on the um, website, the Canvas website, is, is that you are going to have your homework um, assignments. So if you go to home, there's also the syllabus here. Also, I'm gonna make an attempt to record the lecture, although I'm having some problems and difficulties with the mic, so hopefully it's recording. Um, so the recorded lectures would be placed here, and then you're going to have for week one, you need to do your practice homework. Okay, so that would be um, going in, and you're gonna click on this, and it's gonna be a multiple choice. The homework is um, due on a particular date. And um, it also, like for example, this homework doesn't become available um, until the second. So this is when it's due, but it's due a week ahead, of, I mean, it becomes available a week ahead. And it is over the information that we are talking about in class, and that we, we are going to be talking about. So it's open book, open notes, right? I don't want you sharing answers in terms of like, oh, I did the quiz and I know what all the answers are, and here are the correct answers. So that would be considered cheating, right? You can look at information and you can try to find an answer um, anyway, other than, you know, somebody else who's already taken the quiz and knows the answers. Okay. So um, this is, a small portion of your grade, but it hopefully will help you get motivated and study a little bit more consistently. Um, are there any questions about the online homework? Do you want us to send the assignment? Wants to email it to you? No, it automatically records the score in your gradebook. So you do the assignment, right? You click, and then it tells you if it's right or wrong, and then your grade goes into the into the um, gradebook. So it's something that you need to turn. Okay, we are also, besides the online homework, you'll notice here down under the grading, um, we have in-class quizzes. And so we are, our first quiz will be um, next Wednesday. So it will be over the information presented this week and Monday. So I'll remind you that next Wednesday will be our first quiz. And these are worth 15 points. And... Um, um, they are mainly multiple choice with one short answer question. And really, my goal for having in class quizzes 
is to prepare you for a midterm and a final exam because it's in a very similar format. And so you get used to like, how does this instructor test, right? You don't want to wait until the midterm to find that out, right? You want to do it a little bit at a time. And so that's why we have the in-class quizzes. Also, there's an approximate point distribution on page three with the midterm, the final exam. The lab portion and the lab notebook portion is like almost 30% of your grade. And so if you come to lab and if you participate in lab and if you put all your labs together into a notebook and turn it in, that is a really good way to boost possible you know, um, lower scores that you might get on the midterm and the final. And so lab, just coming to lab, you know, generally raises people's grade by one grade. So let's say you get all C's on the midterm and the final exam, and um, you come to lab and you do your lab notebook, generally it raises people up to an A, B, right? So um, just remember that, that, that participation is a big part of the, of the, of the course grade. And then you have some information about accommodation if you need some um, assistance. And then expected student behavior. And then if you turn the page, the last back of the sheet, I have uh, included something that I just personally have found really important in just like my everyday life. And these are, you probably maybe have heard of these before. These are what are called the energy allies. Um, these are just ways to, um, to do well in life, I think. And the first is to um, speak with impeccability. And so stay on topic, you know, speak from like uh, I rather than say, oh, we find this, you know, disagreeable. It's like we, I find this disagreeable instead of speaking for the whole group. Um, and then, um, know how when to stop talking and like if you've ever had those people in your classes that raise their hand and it's like totally off topic and you're like why did they even ask that question and it gets everybody all just like you know they're then you kind of know what it's like when you don't have that agreement in a classroom right okay so don't assume anything right so maybe I'm having a bad day maybe you are having a bad day Right, so I'm not going to assume anything about it. I'm just going, the one assumption I'm going to make is that I'm going to assume that you are doing your best. Okay, so when you come to class, I'm going to make that assumption that you are here and that you are doing the very best you can. Okay, and then um, that kind of goes along with don't take anything personally, not making up stories like, oh, I used to do this all the time when I was, oh, that teacher hates me. She has it out for me, right? And you're like, and really, seriously, we, I, most people, it's, that's not the case, right? It might be that just you just having a bad day and you just happen to catch them at a moment when they had something else that they were thinking about and they might have ignored you and you thought, oh, that person, you know, she has it out for me. But really, that's not the case in most instances. And then just to always do your best, okay? Because there's obviously lots of variation in our backgrounds. And so, there are some people that, you know, take in lots of biology and know a lot of that biology, and then there's maybe some people that haven't ever taken a, a regular biology class in here. Um, I find that hard to believe it. It is true. Some people get here and they're like, this is the very first biology class I've ever had. And um, so just realize that um, there are all different um, backgrounds and experiences that um, come into this a class like this. Okay. Are there any questions about the syllabus? Let me know if you go out to Canvas. Send me an email. Yes. I have a question. Um, yeah. Is lab every week? It is. So then what time is Wednesday lab? 2. 2 to 4.30. Okay. And it is downstairs in ST115. So if you just go around the corner and go down the stairs, it's pretty much right there. And my office is over in the corner. Okay, if I can't come today to lab, I can show up on Wednesday. Yes. So if you're like, I did not think I had to go to lab today, come Wednesday. Okay. Yeah. Anybody else in that situation? No. Yeah, you think you're going to come on Wednesday too? I just don't want like, everybody to come on Wednesday because I only have so many seats in the lab. Okay. 
So if you go onto campus and you don't have access to the Biology 101, make sure you send me an email um, and make sure that you try out that practice quiz. Um, as long as you try it, you get the points for it. No matter if you get the questions wrong, I'm just going to go in and adjust everybody's score. But if you just fail to even open it, then you'll get a zero, right? So you want to at least try to do the homework, uh, maybe even today or tomorrow before Wednesday, so that um, if you have any questions about it, you can um, come to me. Okay, so chapter one, Biology 101, talks about the characteristics of living organisms. And so um, this is like if you went to a foreign world and you were trying to figure out what was living and what was non-living, these would be some of the things that, as we define life on this planet that you would look for, okay? So living things have organization. And you're like, well, non-living things do too, like crystals, they have organization. But this organization that we're going to talk about is um, requires energy to maintain, okay? So oftentimes we talk about how um, things tend, just in the physical properties of them, things tend to go from ordered to disordered. And you've all experienced this in terms of like housekeeping, right? You get everything organized and if you don't put any energy into it, it's by the end of the week, it's just like disaster, right? And so that idea of a state of disorder, a measure of being disordered is called entropy. So things tend to increase their entropy over time. So entropy is a measure of disorder. Okay. So a high entropy system is highly disordered. And things tend to go towards disorder just naturally, kind of like gravity, right? So things tend to become or go towards more disordered over time. The second thing is that they have to obtain energy and materials from their environment. So living things obtain energy and material from their environment. So energy is the ability to do work and there's different types of energy. So if I was to define energy, it is the ability, ability to do work. So we have chemical energy. So for example, glucose which is a sugar, is a source of chemical energy. So like when we're really tired, we might like eat something that has lots of sugar in it in order to produce more energy, okay? Another form of chemical energy is a molecule that is called ATP. So you might have heard of ATP because this is what we use. This is the form of energy that we use to, to power our muscles. So muscle contraction uses ATP. We also um, have, um, besides just chemical energy, you could talk about solar energy. And this would be like sunlight. 
We could also talk about mechanical energy. And this would be like movement. Okay, so different types of energy. Material, on the other hand, is matter. And, and for our particular purposes, might be defined a little bit differently in physics class, but is matter. And matter is anything that has mass, right? So anything with mass. So solar energy does not have weight, does not have mass. So it is different. Solar energy would be different than material. Now, chemical energy does have mass, right? And it's just a type of energy, but it allows us to do work, okay? So in that terms, there's a little bit of ambiguity between the idea of energy and material. And I'm going to kind of explain this in more detail in a second. So when we talk about matter and mass, um, say, for example, we talk about um, atoms, and we're going to talk about basic chemistry in more detail. But the atoms in our body include, say, for example, carbon, oxygen, hydrogen, etc. So those are some of the atoms that we find in our body. And those all have mass. So those are our material. Now, we can um, use energy to um, capture material from our environment. So if we look at the process of photosynthesis, So photosynthesis takes place in like plants, but also some algae, maybe even some animals, very few, but some are capable of photosynthesis. And so when we look at the chemical equation for photosynthesis, we could say, and I'm, I'm not gonna balance it, but it, we could say that, for example, we take CO2, that's carbon dioxide. So this is, this has matter, right? So that's material carbon dioxide, and we combine it with water, and we add sunlight. That's the energy. Okay. Here, the sunlight can convert this into glucose, which is C6H12O6, plus oxygen, plus Oh, plus oxygen. Yeah. Not plus oxygen. Okay. Okay. So this is glucose. You could write glucose underneath here. And then you could write oxygen here. Okay. So this chemical reaction shows the interplay between energy and material. So they obtain energy through sunlight, they obtain material. Through carbon dioxide. Now, can we see carbon dioxide? No, right? So this, so this room, because we're breathing out CO2 as a waste product, it has carbon dioxide in it, but it's not something that we can see. And so things and that are our plants and that are capable of photosynthesis can use the, the material, the carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, to produce energy and also to produce organic molecules that make up the the structure of a tree, for example. Okay. And then their waste product is oxygen. Okay. So this is opposite of what is referred to as cellular respiration. Okay. So cellular respiration Think respiration, think gas, right? Think oxygen. And think cellular means it takes place in all of our cells in our body, okay? So when we talk about cellular respiration, it is the exact opposite. It's kind of the reverse chemical reaction um, than uh, photosynth so photosynthesis. 
So now we have glucose. Okay, so it has matter, it has six carbon atoms, it has 12 hydrogen atoms, it has six oxygen atoms. We're gonna combine that with oxygen okay, in a chemical reaction that is going to produce carbon dioxide as a waste product, water as a waste product, and energy in the form of ATP. And so this is the energy. Okay. So now we've converted matter back into energy. So there's a conversion. And once you can, when you convert things back and forth from one form to another, the, um, the byproduct is heat. So heat tends to be released from um, when you convert one form of energy to another, material to energy or energy to material. Okay. Okay. So I have, going to pass out, and I hope this works, I didn't actually have the time to make sure it's gonna work. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna close this up. So we're gonna use the quarters, this quarter. And specifically, uh, for uh, part of the quiz, we're gonna use the quarters. Okay, so this is just a test run. Let's hope they work. Okay. Even if they don't work, it'll be, it'll work anyway. Oops. Oops. Yeah. Okay. We'll see if this works. But even if it doesn't work, it's the same. We're just going to answer these questions. Okay. So when a large tree should be grows from a tiny seedling, most of the mass comes from where? Where does the mass come from when that happens? Okay. So try, could somebody try clicking? Even going to record the responses. Yes, yes. How many people do we have in here? Three, four, five, three. It doesn't matter. I do not know what you're doing. Answer is, so don't you worry about it. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Yeah. Okay, there's 22 of you. So, have you tried to click and maybe it didn't respond? Do you get a little, what do you get? A little zero, or what does it look like? Green light with your answer. A green light with your answer. And a red light, if not. Does anybody get red lights? You guys got red lights? When you click, red light. Does everybody answer? <coughs> you answered everybody's answers? Okay. So click again. Now, do you get a green light? 
Or maybe your red ring colored line. We'll work on that. Okay. So let's see what everybody put, even though we don't have everybody's up there. I guess I could uh, calibrate all of these again. Where did it go? Okay, so look back at your photosynthesis. So you get all the reaction. What is the material that is being captured? That sunlight is energy. It is not matter. What? Carbon dioxide, right? So carbon dioxide is the material. Most of the tree is made up of a chemical called cellulose, a molecule called cellulose. And cellulose is like the skeletal system of a tree. And it is composed of carbon. And so carbon dioxide is molecules in the, you should say, in the air, right? So the molecules in the air are what make up the tree. Okay, and you're like, well, I don't even see those CO2 molecules in there, right? But that is true, even though we can't see it, they're really abundant, right? And plants take them up, okay? Okay. Okay. Ultimately, almost all ecosystems derive their energy from the Only eight. Has everybody clicked? We had at least 13 last time. Okay, we'll see what this says. Sun, yes. So that is correct. So energy is sunlight. Now, this is an interesting one because up until the point when we discovered them, we didn't think there were any ecosystems that were based upon energy from the center of the planet. But now they've discovered way deep in the bottom of the oceans, there are vents that release hydrogen sulfide gas. And that actually is the fuel for the ecosystems that include pretty large fish, crabs, all kinds of other um, organisms that, including like uh, thermal vent worms, right, that live down where there is no sunlight. So there are a few ecosystems that actually get their energy from the center of the planet. Okay. Okay, enzymes. We haven't talked about those yet, but are they living or not living? Think about the characteristics that we just talked about. Are they living or not living? <laughs> Click again. Take a guess, 50-50 chance. See what we find. Okay. 60 40. The correct answer is, is that they're not living. Not living. 
Enzymes can be active or they can be inactive. So sometimes they say, this contains live enzymes. You, you think to yourself, that doesn't make any sense, right? Um, so packaging sometimes is confusing. It should be active enzymes, right? If you drink milk that has been not been pasteurized, like people are from Washington, like Walla Walla area, you can buy milk that is not pasteurized, and it has active enzymes in it, which actually help with digestion. It also has bacteria in it, which is what you said, but kind of way of, you know, the two things, right? So enzymes are not living. Okay, last question. Fossil fuel was once what? I mean, we haven't directly um, talked about this in this class, but what do you think from like what you've read or heard or the past experience? So oh, there's two laws from the center of the earth. Let's say ignore that. Let's say, let's say just press that D off of there. We know there's at least 10 clippers that are working. Oh, 11. 12. Oops. Okay. Fossil fuels were once vegetation. So what happened is a long time ago, plants were capturing carbon from the atmosphere. Then the plants started to, to, to decay, right? And maybe they got buried. So if you think about like the fogs that you see back in the Jurassic period with all those dinosaurs roaming around, right? Imagine those kind of like getting buried and then that vegetation decomposing and then it turns into oil and it turns into coal, right? So it is actually, fossil fuel is actually captured CO2 through the use of sunlight as energy. So it's actually captured sunlight, right? Each is captured in sunlight. And they say that fossil fuels are not renewable because of the amount of time it, it takes to make a fossil fuel is way longer than we as a um, civilization are going to be around. Right, so we can't like make our own fossil fuels, right? Because it took too long to make them in the first place, right? We can make biofuels with plant material, um, like corn oil, it's a biofuel, um, but um, fossil fuels would be vegetation, okay? So that's just a little um, few questions that relate to energy and materials as they relate to biology, biological principles, okay. Okay, so living things have organization. They obtain energy and materials from their environment. Okay, so number three. They are capable, let's see, living things are capable of reproduction. And there's actually two different types of reproduction. There's essentially the cloning, the asexual reproduction, but the reproduction that we think of as sexual, where the egg and the sperm are produced and they produce an offspring that is entirely different from the parents, which is really important because variation is super important to um, the survival of um, a group of organisms, and we'll talk about that more, okay? So they're capable of reproduction. They are also, living things are responsive. Okay, so they interact with their environment. And the environment can be broken down into a into excuse me into non-living versus living components, and those have terms that go along with them. 
So abiotic, anytime you see a in front of a word, that means without. So the asexual is without sex. Abiotic means without life. One thing that is not living would be, for example, water. So water is not considered to be living. We have minerals, like what we find in the soil, um, like calcium or iron, which we need in our bodies for different functions. Um, also, temperature would be abiotic. So we interact, right? As opposed to biotic components, which is living parts of the environment. So this would be things like mates, prey, predators, other things that we interact with, maybe competitors, right? That's prey, as in animals that we hunt to eat. Okay, so those are the two different um, components of the environment that we respond to or responsive to. Okay. Okay, so if we look at, oops, topic. Okay, so let's look at the different levels of organization that we see. So that was one of the, that was the first characteristic of life, right, was the levels of organization. So we are going to start at the atomic level. So we're going to talk about atoms, and we're not going to do that until, um, in detail, until um, Wednesday. And then we have molecules, right? So we've talked about carbon as being an atom. That's an example. Molecules would be glucose. These molecules um, come together, and in living organizations, they produce cells. Now, cells are unique because this is the level of organization where we say it is living. Right? So we make that demarcation there. So we say that cells are the fundamental unit of life. And one of the characteristics that's so important about cells is, is that they have a boundary, right? They have a membrane, an outer membrane, which we're gonna look at in, in today's lab or this week's lab, right? They have a boundary and outer membrane, and this regulates what goes into and out of the cell. So it regulates the internal environment. So one interesting aside here, is, is that when we look at something really small, it's something you probably, everybody's heard of here, it's a virus, okay? So I'm gonna put this as kind of as an aside, right? The virus, what are viruses composed of? Are they composed of cells or not composed of cells? Anybody know? Yes. They actually do not have cells in and of themselves. They actually have to use their host cell to reproduce, okay? So these are just composed, they're not composed of cells. They're just composed of protein and genetic material. So they must infect a host cell to reproduce. Right? So they have that characteristic that they are capable of reproducing. You're like, well, they gotta be alive because they can reproduce themselves and make us sick, right? So this is like, is this living or is this not? We don't really know what to 
consider it. Some people think that viruses are part of our genetic material that escaped and became renegade. Kind of like cancer cells, you know how cancer cells become renegade cells? This is renegade genetic material that is only reproducing for the benefit of itself. And then it goes from one individual to the next and it makes us sick by reproducing inside. So you could put living, question mark, right? It has some of the characteristics, but not all, right? Of um, the other types of organisms that we see on the planet. Okay. So the next level from cells are what are referred to as tissues. And these are groups of cells with a common structure and a common function. So a good example of this would be Smooth muscle. Does anybody know where do we find smooth, that particular type of muscle in our body? As opposed to skeletal or cardiac. Where do we find, what is one place in your body where you have lots of smoothness? Actually, there's lots of smoothness. Does anybody need to take a guess? Skin. Skin, actually, like the muscle that makes our hair stand on end, that's actually skeletal, weirdly enough. Anybody else? What moves without our conscious effort, besides the heart? The lungs do. That's the diaphragm. That's actually skeletal. Huh? Yeah, but what moves? Tongue is actually skeletal. <laughs> okay. How about our digestive system? Okay, so that type of tissue, smooth muscle, is in our digestive system and it causes like this wave of contraction that just goes, it's like, it's called peristalsis and it has to continually occur. And when you're, if your digestive system stops moving, they get really worried, right? Doctors will get really worried. If you've ever been in the hospital, they're like, you gotta get up and walk around because we gotta get that digestive system moving again, right? Because Physical movement actually helps us restart the digestive system. Okay. So the digestive system moving, the stomach churning, the um, food moving from the small intestine, large intestine into the rectum, all of that is due to smooth muscle. Okay. And then we can have organs. Okay. And organs contain more than one type of tissue. So the stomach is an organ. It contains muscle plus nervous, for example. It contains lots of other ones, tissues, but it contains nervous tissue. And you might have heard of what they're now calling the gut brain because they think that your digestive system is like and the, and the nervous system that is in your digestive system is super important now. And so, for example, you can feel things in your gut, and it also might be the basis for depression and anxiety would be that nervous system that is in your digestive tract. They call it the gut brain, or the second brain. So the stomach contains muscle, but it also has nervous tissue. For those of you who have taken psychology, 90% of serotonin is in our digestive system, not in our brain, okay? Serotonin is super important for regulating mood. Okay, so that's the organ. And then we have systems. And systems would be more than one organ, so you can see how we're becoming more complex. So the digestive system not, is not just the stomach, right? 
So it's the stomach plus the liver plus the intestines, the small intestine and large intestine, etc. We're not going to go into the systems a lot this quarter. Um, we are going to spend more time at the cellular and the genetic level. But um, when we study systems, and when scientists study it, they oftentimes separate them, right? And so when we talk about the digestive system, we don't talk about the nervous system, or we don't talk about the immune system. And now we're trying to put them back together. So in Eastern, um, uh, like more Chinese, for example, medicine, they realize the systems interact, right? They don't really separate them out the way that we do. But if you have a stomach issue, you go to a, um, a gastroenterologist, right? And he can give you pills for your stomach issue. And then if you have a psychological issue, you go to a psychiatrist. And he gives you drugs for your psychological issue. And then they don't realize that both of those things can affect one another. And like sometimes your drugs, your psychological drugs, can affect your digestive system in a negative way and vice versa, right? And so the idea in modern medicine is to put things together, right? So for example, let me just give you one example. How about a neuro um, endocrinologist? Okay. So those are two different systems, right? So you would go, that's a neurologist. He studies your nervous system, right? What is an endocrinologist study? What do, what do endocrine glands produce? What is like, what is like your thyroid produce? What is your pituitary produce? What type of molecule? Nobody knows. If you're having problems with your, say for example, if you're having problems with your thyroid and you're like burning energy like crazy, you're losing weight, you're, you're hot, you know, your eyeballs are starting to stick out, right? where you would go to an endocrinologist and he would test your, well, close, hormones, right? So hormones are really important in regulating your internal state, right? And so they would test your thyroid hormones. And if your, your thyroid hormones are way off the chart, you could have hyperthyroidism, Graves' disease, right? And they have to get those hormones back in, in tune, right? So this is a person that would study the nervous system plus the endocrine system and their interaction, right? So putting things back into the context of the whole organism. Okay, so from the systems, obviously we then go to the organism. Okay. And we define the organism that that is which is able to produce offspring, right? Can produce offspring. It's important to realize that some species, like amoeba, is only a single cell, but it is a complete organism. So an amoeba has to do everything that we do, but it only has one cell, right? We are multicellular, so we're, we have all this other internal organization, and then it's my whole body that is, has to work together in order for me to produce offspring. Okay. We then, from the organism, we have a population. So at the population level, these are groups of individuals of the same species. So they are capable of potentially reproducing with one another. And we're gonna talk about population genetics. And we're gonna talk about how populations adapt to their environment, how they change. Okay, so that's at the very end of the quarter, we'll talk about that. Then we have community. Okay, this is all the species in a given area. Okay, so all the living organisms in a particular area. 
So we could talk about you know communities up in the um, up in the blue, blue mountains, right? So we could talk about the, um, um, the the community of trees and animals that exist up there. We can also talk about ecosystems. That's the next level. So this is biotic plus abiotic components. So if when we're talking about the community up in the Blue Mountains, we talk, also study water erosion. If we study temperature, if we study seasonal, right? That would mean that we're studying the entire ecosystem of the Blue Mountains. And then finally, we have the level of the biosphere. And this is the entire planet. So it's kind of interesting when we start to look at these from population to biosphere, that is the study of ecology, essentially. Right? We're not going to do a lot of ecological discussion this quarter, um, but next quarter you will if you take biology 102. And when you look at this, it's kind of interesting because we see some of the same processes that occur within an individual occur within these systems as well. So, like, they have to they maintain a particular order, right? So, so certain things happen on a regular interval so that they maintain an order and don't completely go to disorder. When you look at a community, sometimes you take out one species and the whole thing just falls apart, right? The whole thing would collapse if you take out one group or one species. And so these still have those characteristics of living um, that they need an organization and they have to have energy and materials to put into it to maintain that organization. So the last thing I'm going to do today is I'm just going to show you a, a, a short, short video called the Minute Earth video. It's Minute Earth is the plant, is the, is the guy who puts them together. But it specifically talks about the rainforest ecosystem. So just a second. A tropical rain. And he talks fast. It's like, you know, it's maybe a little bit more than a minute, but it's kind of a fast video. So, let's see. In forest without rain, wouldn't be much of a rainforest. I mean, all plants need water to grow, and without it, they shrivel up and die. So, what about the ancient Hawaiian proverb, Hahai no ka ua ika ula ao, which means the rain follows after the forest? How could that be? Well, all land plants lose water when the pores on their leaves open up during photosynthesis, and this evaporation draws more water up through their stems. With so much rain soaking the soil in rainforests, water is nearly unlimited, and accordingly, rainforest trees can afford to move and lose more water than other plants. All that water vapor rising from the forest feeds moisture-laden clouds while also causing convection. Together, these effects accelerate the formation of rain, which falls to the soil and gets taken up all over again. This cycle of absorption, evaporation, and rain happens everywhere there are plants. However, super wet soil, fast pumping trees, and hot tropical sun make the cycle so fast in the rainforest that unlike other biomes where clouds might form in one place and rain in another, in a rainforest all that water stays in the same region. Without the forest pumping so much water into the air, rainforests wouldn't be as rain. And without so much rain, the forest couldn't pump so much water into the air. So which came first, the rain or the rainforest? Well, before rainforests, ancestors of trees like cypress, pine, and spruce dominated the land. But they were conservative when it came to using and losing water, so the air tended to be dry, meaning less rain. However, around 130 million years ago, a new kind of plant developed that took the risk of losing more water in return for souped-up photosynthesis. These were the flowering plants, and their risk paid off. Their faster growth enabled them to outcompete the ancestral pines and take over the tropical regions of the globe. These angiosperms lost so much water into the air that as they spread, they brought their own rain with them. And today, tropical rainforests receive more rain than if they were pine forests. In some places, as much as a meter more rain each year. That's equivalent to an extra two and a half hours of heavy rain each week. Not surprisingly, all that water cools off the forest, too, which is why the Amazon isn't nearly as hot as the Sahara or even an East Texas pine forest in summer. 
But the hot, dry tropics of the past may soon be a part of our future. In parts of the Amazon where vast swaths of rainforest have been logged or cleared for agriculture, unusual droughts are already occurring, and forest fires have become more frequent. Scientists worry that these changes will lead to ever hotter, drier, and more flammable tropics in the coming decades, making things tougher both for the remaining forest and for the people who live there. So when in drought, plant a tree. Seriously. Ha ha, no ka ua, ni ka ua la ao. Okay. So that's the idea that even at larger, you know, larger levels of organization is that we we still have these systems in place. And so if you take out the tree, if you cut down the tree, there's going to be less rain. So how many people would have thought that that would have been the case? I would have thought it would have rained the same no matter what, right? But no, if you clear the forest, then there's less rain and it's hotter and drier. Okay. So that's how, even at that level of organization, we have that responsiveness, the interaction between abiotic and biotic components of the environment. Okay, so I'm going to stop there for today and make sure that you come to lab this week. Make sure you bring a binder. I have extra binders from recycled students, recycled student binders downstairs on the table in front of my office. If you want to grab one of those, um, do you bring one with you today? And also make sure that you go onto Canvas and try your practice homework to make sure that it works and you have access to it. Extra, thank you. Oh, clickers, we can bring them down here to the front table. The lab today was fill, filled up. Did today's labs filled? The lab filled, but okay. somebody was going to go to Wednesdays. Do you need to come to Monday's lab? Um, I can go to either, but I guess I could. You could uh, wait and come to 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 let's see. Come to Wednesday this week, okay. and then we'll find out how people okay. shuffle. Uh, can I come to Wednesday too? Yes. Okay. Do you want to go to Wednesday? You're on Monday. Yeah, yeah. Why don't you guys just switch? You guys could just switch. He wants to go so to that's Wednesday. What, that's what I was just saying. Okay. Yeah. So why don't you guys just switch? Okay. You'd rather come to Monday. Just come to Monday, and you come to Wednesday. Okay. Yep. Cool. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Thank you. That's the wrong one of these, maybe.